Okay, I will talk a bit about intelligence and how we see intelligence in psychology and the science of psychology. Because um, a lot of people think that we have multiple intelligences or that we really don't know what intelligence is. But in psychology we just say, well, there's something called a general intelligence and we know what it is and we can measure it. And this general intelligence is the G factor, general factor. And then we measure it by IQ, intelligent quotient. So you have this factor in your head and we, we cannot measure it directly. So we cannot put a rod in your head and measure this G factor, but we can give you certain tests and then we know how intelligent you are or how high your general intelligence is. And all the other intelligence stuff you hear about, about multiple intelligences or something else or something philosophical, it's not really factors we can measure. It's something people talk about. They think they think it could be there. Maybe it's not there. But in uh, in science, we just test stuff, and then when we see it, then we think it's there. So we we see intelligence as this as this e IQ, and we know it's there. But all the other stuff, we uh, we have never found it. So we have tested and tested, searched and searched for it, but never found it. Only found this kind of intelligence. And this is how it looks like the G factor. So you have a lot of sub factors and they still correlate with G factors. So for example, one can be your spatial ability, the ability to rotate 3D objects in your head and perceive 3D objects, or the other can be verbal ability. So one could be more correlated with G factor or less correlated with G factor, but there are still, uh, there are still a lot of sub, sub factors. And usually if you're good at one thing, academic thing then you will be good at other academic things if you just try to learn them this is how it usually is so you will uh, if you have some someone who is a great um, great at physics then we'll probably also be good at uh, most other subjects in academia but you could of course have someone who's really good at one thing and then not that good at another thing And this is how we measure IQ. So my favorite test is probably the one on the upper right, where you see these figures, and then you have to guess the next one. That's the one I got um, when I um, when I tested for Mensa. When I tried to get into Mensa, I, I got this test, and then I got 40 of these questions, and I had 40 minutes. So I had one minute per, per this kind of uh, square. And uh, I, had, I had to really hurry up with my, uh, with my pencil, really like go back and forth, try to solve it and, and it worked pretty well. But I like this because it's, it feels for me, it feels very universal. I didn't need to uh, understand a certain language. I just, everyone can do these kind of tests, everyone in the world. But the first one you see is, it's with um, animals. So if you have two ducks, then you have one bird. If you have two birds, then what comes next? Uh, yeah and then the number series you the next number in the in the row or you can have analogies a brother is to a sister like a father is to or a joke to humor is like law is to something and all this stuff is testing intelligence so even if you only have one of these kind of tests with for example number series you get 40 of them different ones and then you solve them all, all as fast as you can. Even if you only get that test, we still can measure your IQ. But uh, many tests, they give you different kind of variations of these, um, of these questions to also see your sub factors. Because if you have some trouble in your life, then we, we need to know everything about your brain and how it works. So maybe a sub factor in your brain is not working as well as the other factors. But usually all the, these factors are working pretty well, if one works well. And then for me, the favorite one is just the figures alone, because it's, it's also highly effective at testing IQ, measuring G factor, but it's so, so simple. And you can even make one yourself at home. And then this is a test men are better at it, women. So for example, rotating figures, seeing stuff in 3D, perceiving 3D stuff. But also, if this is true, for example, you would see that men are better at PC games. You would see them on average, only on average. 
You also see that men will be better at professional driving because they perceive 3D objects better and faster. But on the roads, of course, men would not be better drivers because men have higher testosterone levels. So they will be more aggressive drivers and drive faster. So even though they have higher spatial abilities on average, they will still be worse drivers because they get into more accidents. They also, of course, would be uh, more crane workers that are male because of this extra, on average, extra intelligence. There will be many women who could do this better than the average man. And of course, women are also better at something. This is another sub factor. This is the verbal intelligence. Women would be better at this. They will uh, be better able at, at speaking, better uh, know more words and stuff like that. And I also think we te we, uh, we could test this in a billion types of, uh, types of way. There are a lot of ways to test your verbal abilities. But women on average will have higher verbal ability. And there will probably be, um, if this was true, then there will be more women in language jobs and language educations. Then you have these kind of ways to test IQ. The first one is the, you see uh, two glasses with an equal amount of water. Then you pour one of the glasses into a tall glass, but slim one. And then you see with C, you have these two glasses again. You have the tall glass and you have the short glass, equal amount of water. But small kids will have a hard time telling you that there's an equal amount of water in both glasses, even though you just they just saw sort of pour the water into a, a tall glass. So I think it's uh, how fast you develop this ability probably, probably correlates with intelligence. So the faster you develop it in your in your age, and I believe you develop it at one year instead of two years then you will uh, you will have um, a higher intelligence also later on in life and then probably also how fast you solve it and stuff like that actually i don't i'm not really 100 percent sure but you can look it up it's pressure pressure test then you have this uh, middle test i really really like that probably one of my favorite iq tests first we see how fast you press a button so you just hold down your hand on this middle button and then you press as fast as possible uh, or just uh, a random button then we have we know how fast you're pressing and then you have to press the button that is under the light bulb that slides up for example the if the upper light bulb lights up you have to press this button as fast as possible so now you know how fast you react just randomly and how fast you react to a light bulb lightning up so we can subtract the first one from the second one and now we have a pretty good measure of your IQ. So if people react faster, that means they have higher IQ. It's a pretty good test, but as many other tests, it's not really um, it's not really perfectly correlated with G factor because it only measures G factor to a good degree, but not a not a great degree as some of the other more complicated tests do. So you will get a, a good estimation, but if you need, if you want to have a better estimation, then do the figure test. And the one you have on the right is two lines. You see a short line and a long line, and then they're covered. And they're covered actually in a few milliseconds, you see them, and then in a few milliseconds later, then they, they disappear. And people with high intelligence, they will have, um, they will be better at this test. So they will, uh, spend fewer milliseconds at deciphering which line is better, is longer than the other line and if you have a lower intelligence you have a harder time with this and you need more milliseconds to to look at this and decipher which line is longer again it's a good iq test but it doesn't test it perfectly so it's only to a degree and i wouldn't subst i wouldn't do these tests to substitute these uh, figure tests i showed before Oh, this one is a good one. This is again the Peugeot uh, test. Again, on the upper row, you see how kids will react if they have a hard time understanding objects. So if you have two rows of coins, they'll see, okay, there's an equal amount of coins, coins in each. But if they have low IQ or still have not developed this ability, then they will tell you that in the right, in the right coin rows, the upper coin row has more coins than the lower ones. 
because they just see it as a more object. So there are more coins there, I think. As uh, you see there with mass and water conservation. So if you have a if you have a very intelligent brain, you'll probably earn, uh, learn this much earlier. And one of the fun tests is the one on the left where you see a small child. You can have even very small babies look at the objects and then the faster they learn ob object permanence, the better. So we see these babies and we want to test their IQ. For example, if they're six months old, a mother sits them on her lap. And then we see what they look at at the screen because there's a camera that tracks their eyes. So we always know what they have looked at on the screen. And if you see one object go through another object, then if they, um, they have a bad ability at solving that task at understanding that this breaks the rules of physics, then that brain is not that well developed. But if they understand that the rules of physics are broken when an object goes to another object, then they will look at that and find it curious that this appears on the screen and we know that they can perceive it better. And on the right you have the marshmallow experiment, very famous experiment. It's uh, when, for example, an adult comes into the room, gives a child a marshmallow and then tells the child that if you wait 15 minutes, I will give you another marshmallow. And these child's of, uh, kids, of course, love sugar, as do all other apes. Probably all our, our apes, we love sugar because it's good energy source for human beings. So we always love fruit in a natural environment. Well, these kids, they sit and if they're better at waiting, then they have higher IQ. And this also means that um, they will like, get uh, higher wages later on in life, on average. They will like, get higher grades and they will have a higher job status later on in life. So because IQ correlates with all these factors, and of course they're also better at just waiting. They also have this patience effect in their body. I don't know what that is, but that, that's probably also something there. But at least uh, this correlates highly with IQ too. So if you do this well, you have a high IQ. You understand better, you're better at controlling yourself. And this is, um, this is uh, harder for me to explain. Uh, because this is how you solve problems. So for example, if I give you an IQ test or if I tell you to think about something complicated, then low IQ people, they will activate more of the brain. So they will use more of the brain. They will put more energy, consume more glucose, sugar with the brain by solving these problems. If you have a high IQ, then you will spend less energy inside your brain on solving these complicated problems. It's like being very, very muscular. If you're very muscular, you can lift things easier. Okay? But muscles, of course, are not the same as IQ because IQ is highly heritable. So most of your IQ is just, that's how you're born. With muscles, you can, tra you can train them too. But with IQ, you need to understand it. It's like if everyone was training exactly the same amount, then you had have get the IQ. It's like height. It's height, yeah. And as you see, this is uh, how the, the divide is of IQ. It's a bell curve. And as you see, there are very few people who are, we can call them degenerates or low intelligence or retards. I, I don't know what, what the common term is today because you always change it because one term becomes uh, offensive and then you change it into something else. But just call it low intelligence. then. It, it will be okay but there are few there are few people of, of those kind and there are also few people who have high, very high intelligence and then there are a lot of people who have just regular intelligence so they will consume media pretty much the same or understand media the same way and they, they they will not understand the very complicated media and the ones with very low IQ will have a really hard time maybe even understanding a regular Marvel movie while the people with high IQ, they can watch more intelligence media and can, yeah, consume that, understand it fully too, and even create very intelligence media. That's also hard. The average IQ, yeah, I didn't make any spelling errors. I don't have any spelling control here, so I could have made some errors here and there, but I just found this pic these pictures online. 
So what we see in the average IQ is that uh, for men and women it's pretty much the same, it's 100, right? So uh, among men, women the average will be 100 and among men the average will be 100. But you will have more men that have very high or very low intelligence, while women there will be more average intelligence. There will be much fewer high intelligence women and low intelligence women. And this is the controversy of IQ. I think maybe there are more controversies, but this is the biggest one by far because this has something to do with races. So on average, we see that, uh, for example, if you test people in USA, then the black, the black people will have an average 15 points lower IQ than the white people. But of course, you will have East Asians or Orientals that will have even higher IQ than white people. And then Hispanics, they will be between black and white people. So if this is true, of course, then East Asians will have to have a higher wage than white people because IQ correlates with wages. And this is also true. And at the upper, I think it's uh, intelligence and the B is uh, height. As you can see, this is why uh, people say that intelligence can't be influenced by parents and upbringing because it actually can actually. So there is an effect from parents to children directly. So if you have clever parents or parents that uh, do a lot of work with children, then of course the, the IQ will uh, have be influenced by that. The thing is that this effect pretty much completely disappears. We, we don't see it after a few years. No matter what you did to the children, no matter what upbringing you used, no matter what test you did, no matter how, what music you played to the kids, the effect on them will completely disappear. We will not be able to uncover it at all. And then the gen genetic effect will take over. So now the children grow up, they get their own interests and their brain develops into its own thing. And they can select what media to consume to. And they kind of just become themselves. So, and they cannot, we cannot increase IQ on, or make it lower. So there are no education or no work, nothing we, we can do to, to really increase IQ. It's just given to you. It's like height, as you see. First, you have the shared environment, with how, which food you eat and stuff like that. It influences uh, height, but that later on in life, this influence disappears and height kind of becomes what you have inherited through your parents, through their genes. And of course, you also have the non-shared environment. That's the random effect. And that can still remain into old age. So uh, these random variabilities, we don't know what they are, but they influence IQ and they influence height. But we don't know what it is. It's just something out there. Something that can influence uh, IQ negativity is, for example, uh, lead. If you eat lead when you are a small kid, that can influence your IQ negativity. Or if you have very, very little food, so you are malnourished all the way through your childhood, they can influence your IQ and low weight. And or maybe if you have a very, very high stress environment when you grow, grow up old or grow up, so it should be very, very stressful. So your brain is constantly on a stress. Then you will have a low IQ on average and um, what I, I, I mean shocks to the brain like if you get hit hit to the brain really hard and your brain suffers some consequences so these extreme things can influence IQ but usually in the West we don't see it that much so in the West you don't have uh, lead in wallpapers anymore we have removed that we have removed lead from gasoline and that means also that the environment has less effect on our brain today it's more genetic because we have removed some of the extremely extreme environment. And when you just have the regular environment, you just become yourself. Then the environment loses the effect on you. And this is the twin studies, how we do it. Same DNA, same environment, same DNA, same environment differences or similarities. We measure that. Or we do uh, twin studies where same DNA, different environment. And these twins, they end up... Uh, often end up or pretty much always end up looking extremely similar to each other. So if one grows up in China, the other grows up in Sweden, 
and they meet up when they are 40, they will be extremely similar to each other, even if they adapted to very, very, very different families, because it's just who they are. It's like height, right? Even if you live this place or that place, if the environment is not extreme, you will pretty much get your regular or normal height. As you see, IQ, it's, um, it's one of these things in psychology that have a very, very high um, heritability effect. So as you see with intelligent twin, identical twins, you have a high, high similarity with intelligence. And even if they grow up with different families, they have pretty much the, still the same IQ. So it doesn't really matter if they grow up in the same family or different families, they still get the same IQ when they are 20. Of course, when they are five or 10, then the parents are influencing them, but this influence disappears. And no matter what they grow up, if they are not growing up in extreme environments, their IQ would turn out to be the same because they are identical twins. With fraternal twins, you have uh, less similarity because they have fewer genes in common. So they have one, one kid can have some genes from the mother and some genes from the father, and the other kid have can have some other genes from the mother and some other genes from the father, but they still have uh, some genes that um, that are the same. There will still be a very strong correlation, and you can see personality. That's the oh, uh, that's only extroversion actually, but it's it's pretty high correlated too. But with intelligence, that's a very very high correlation, and with personality, you have a bit lower correlation. Like fifty percent of it is the same, and then fifty percent of it is non-shared environment. With the shared environment is family settings and stuff, so that's the environment they share. And the non-shared environment will be just random things. But we also have the Flynn effect. And the Flynn effect has actually been known before Flynn, but he kind of made it popular. So we can just call him Flynn effect. It's that the IQ grows three points on average every 10 year, years in a population. So for example, in USA, you have seen a growth for three IQ points every 10 years. So if, if people on average got 100 IQ 10 years ago, then today the average IQ would be 103 points, unless something changed, unless immigration and stuff like that can change too, or let a lot of lead in the environment can change it. So we we try to adapt the iq test so the average is always 100 so we always kind of push down um we make one when it turns to 103 we kind of change the iq test so the average is 100 so we always change it adapt it change it adapt it and we don't know really why the iq grows in the population because we know we cannot make it an, an individual more clever no matter what we do no matter how much extra schooling we give them, no matter what kind of food we give them, we cannot make them more intelligent when they have the average environment already, when they always ha already have the schooling um, in the environment, when they always already have the, the okay food, then giving them extra good food won't make them extra intelligent, but giving them very, very, very bad food will make them less intelligent when they grow up. I hope I explained it well. I probably didn't. Uh, fluid and crystallized intelligence. When you grow up, as you can see, you get older, there's something called fluid intelligence, and that's just the IQ you're born with, but then there's also something crystallized intelligence, and that's the stuff you learn. So for example, books, words, uh, usually words, so when you test young people, young adults, you can test them with verbal ability or you can give them math test and they will be as good at both these kind of tests. You just measure the IQ no matter what, what kind of test they do. But when people get older, the IQ sharply declines. When people are 70, the IQ have already declined very, very sharply up to like 15 points to 30 points. And that's a huge decline in IQ. But the thing is, with the crystallized intelligence, they still have a high IQ. So they still measure highly when you give them word tests because they have memorized a lot of words. So they know a lot of words. 
that's the divide in these two intelligences that the crystallized intelligence they have crystallizes in the brain so even though their iq fluid iq goes down they still have this learning but they will be they will be slow at solving problems they won't um, they cannot do a highly complicated task anymore but of course if they start with 150 iq and then their iq declines only 15 points they can still do complicated jumps just not as well not as fast and what iq correlates with is height brain size health life expense expectancy and what about the minus factors so um, I see a lot of people online talking about negative correlations with IQ. So they say that, well, if you have high IQ, you're probably autistic or you probably have this and that in negative things. But uh, actually, we have not really found these things. There are a few things we have maybe found a little effect on. But uh, usually we just say that, well, if you have a higher IQ, there's nothing worse in your, in your life as such on average. It doesn't make anything worse so if you have high iq and you for example are missing a leg it's not because of your high iq if you understand that or if you have very high iq and you have aghd then it's not because of your high iq there's no negative correlation with anything it's just a good thing to have iq it doesn't mean that you don't have anything negative about your brain or stuff like that or difficulties but it's not because of the IQ. It's not because the IQ was higher and then people with low IQ have some fewer negative traits. That's not, not how it works at all. And not, I just found this actually. High IQ, what you have there. Fewer injuries, higher income, low IQ, injury prone, poverty, unemployment, welfare, all this kind of stuff also correlations there as you see there's nothing negative about having high iq you have there's lower crime rate that's not a negative thing and industrious that's not a negative thing good nutrition to you eat better it's not a negative thing it's nothing really negative there education you get higher grades what can i say about that well um, you get a you have more options in your life because you, there are more educations you can take and it will also be easier for you to, to do the test. I kind of explain it a bit here. As you can see, um, on the this is in USA. This is the university educations. It's not a conclusive list, but just something I found online. This is not the super science or anything like that, but I, I think it's a good explanation. Someone kind of just did it for fun but it's not some it's not done by by scientists in academic settings so these numbers something i just found online when physics and astronomy the average iq is actually 143 so it's very very high and then maths philosophy also has a high iq on average economics engineering chemistry very very high iq on average someone has have a low iq some have more high iq biological sciences political sciences still complicated areas but not not as physics english history sociology that's still very much higher than average iq and some uh, people studying sociology will have very high iq some will have uh, not that high iq uh, psychology 113 and then you have more um, um, more simple can i say simple educations more when, when you need you need your use your body you need to use your uh, just work with the tasks physically more than mentally and then student counseling and stuff like that so fit public and administration and student counseling can you actually be good at being a student counselor can you guide can you guide a student so that he will if he has a low iq that he will uh, become a physics professor or can you guide a high um, yeah then probably not right you, you if you have someone walking into your your office and he has an iq of 80 you cannot really guide him into anything so student counseling is not a profession where 
you need a high IQ because that's not much to figure out. You just need to give them an IQ test and then you pretty much know where they can go. And this is the, the more the expanded chart. Social work, early childhood education, student counseling, special education, home economics, administration, as you can see elementary school, public administration, administrative task when you have papers, you fill out papers or you tell people to go there or go there or don't go there or you just kind of round people to support them, um, to be there for them, to guide them a bit but you're not solving any complicated problems. And then higher up you have more the mental tests and also much much higher wages. So higher up here you have um, math related educations and lower here you have human related educations. So these jobs will, will pay less because you change less. You give, on average you give less uh, wealth to the company by working here with social work or elementary teaching and stuff like that. You don't really change anything. You don't influence things as much. Where, where you work with these higher things, then you change a lot, you influence a lot, and you create a lot, a lot of profit. And I mean economic profit, of course not, not anything else, not any human profit or anything like that. Uh, yeah, college mayors again, psychology, education, uh, and how female and males are kind of divided between college majors too. Why did I include this? I don't know why, what I have to say about this actually. Careers. Uh, yeah, there are different kind of jobs, opportunities, and uh, the higher IQ you have, the higher wages you have on average. And also you can see this is just a startup. Actually, uh, the people who invent something very, very complicated and invent something new to give something new to the world, they usually do it when they are under 30, often, if it's physics or mathematics or stuff like that. Then they do it when their high IQ is high, their mental capabilities are high, until they begin declining. Because when, when you have a very high IQ, for example, 170, then you're a genius. And when it starts declining, you just become a regular genius and not a hyper genius. So you cannot invent those extremely, extremely complicated things anymore. Normal IQ and then how many geniuses are very, are very rare. And then you have this and this, and just from New York Times. And of course, I wrote here that artificial intelligence and robot revolution will make some jobs more complicated to get because all these menial tasks, these manual labor tasks and blue collar work jobs, they will be, um, they will be um, solved by computers or robots. And then it will be higher for, for low intelligence people to get a job or find a job because of course, if you're an attorney, a chemist, or executive, then no robot robot will come along right now to solve your job. But if you work in food, or assembly, or nurses aid, then more and more robots will go into your work. So for example, if you're a truck driver, then maybe a robot will take over your job because it's not a complicated task. And there's no really no options for you because if you have low IQ, it's not like you can go to a university and take a degree there. You're pretty much stuck where you are, right? You, you can go from assembler to food service to nurse's aide or truck driver, but you cannot become an attorney unless, of course, you are working suit in a food service and you're very, very intelligent and have this option to you to get to take a higher education. So what does this correlate? Well, wait, out of labor for more than one month, out of a year for men. Of course, with the low IQ people, you will see more people out of labor. We see more people unemployed, men. I don't know if women will, probably not because a lot of women just don't take jobs because they don't want the job, they want to stay at home. Divorced five years, you will have in five years. Low IQ also, more people divorce had illegitimate children, 
you can see very low IQ for over 30% nearly a third have illegitimate children and this is women and then very very few high IQ people have have illegitimate children lives in poverty a lot of low IQ people live in poverty very few high IQ people ever incarcerated for men also for low IQ people but not that high correlation actually a lot of white collar crime probably going on there on the top chronic welfare recipients also that's for mothers a lot of people with low IQ they get welfare high school dropout huge amount of low IQ people drop out of high school huge huge amount where whereas where if you have very high IQ it's pretty much your loss I mean it's up to you to just do it because you already already have the capabilities to do the job and this is workers I'm nearly done it is nearly this last slide um, what the average IQ is and then the highest and lowest measured IQ janitors have a low low IQ on average truck drivers and then you have doctors and college professors electrical engineers legal aides and stuff like that. people working in the legal profession social scientists they all have high IQ and they and the, the lowest IQ they have is not that low and then you go to these jobs and they are they are less complicated to solve so more people more people can do them so a person with 120 IQ can do a janitorial job but a gen the average janitor will not be able to do um, become a college professor and white men uh, out earn black men as you can see then are on the 100 percent oh I have a I actually have a mouse white men they are on 100 percent and then Asian men of course in USA earn much more than white men that's I mean I mean that's a given right if they have a higher IQ then they should earn more because otherwise there's something very very wrong with the picture so yeah that's that's of course what we see and then black people earn less hispanics earn less than white men and with women you have um, you have uh, lower average earnings per hour than men but mostly because uh, a lot of women stay at home uh, so if women get children then they have lower wage than the women who don't get children but uh, still you have Asian women of course make more than white women that's again a given that uh, that would be true of course Ashkenazi Jews I would wish that they had included them in the charts because I think they will be very very high probably higher than Asian when men and Asian women but we, we cannot test all races and the history of IQ is that uh, we developed IQ tests to because we saw some differences in people so we saw that some uh, kids they did well in school some kids didn't do that well and we had no nothing we could do to improve or make it worse so and, and unless we went to the extreme measures to decline IQ we could not do anything so we needed kind of a test to to see well if this kid has this kind of mental ability then we of course will not force him to take complicated math tests but if this uh, kid has a high mental capability then we can put them him in this class so it's a great great tool for psychologists also to see if you have difficulties at school what is it I mean it could be dyslexia that of course more men than women have, will have dyslexia I've already explained to you why because uh, women on average have a higher verbal intelligence of course more men would be dyslexic on the bottom so it can be uh, that you have low IQ or maybe you're dyslexic or have some ADHD or something else so that's why we measure it to see okay what is your problem and try to explain the problem and see what we can do to help out usually it's nothing but usually it's just well you, you have these kind of abilities and you can do this in life so you, you are you are this kind of person for the military uh, for example in USA I think even today they don't take people in 
that who have less than 85 IQ. So under that, they don't take them in because they can make them solve any tasks that one solved. But even if you have 85 IQ, you can still solve some task for the military. Especially if you're a cook or something like that, or a cleaner, then you can still work inside of the military, but probably not can you can probably not become a soldier. As you can see, they have a lot of equipment on their on them. They have a lot of things they need to keep count of on. Um, they have uh, machine guns, pretty advanced. They're getting more and more advanced. So the modern soldier is more and more advanced than than he was before. There's a lot of things you need to solve, and if you have less than 85 IQ, it's very, very hard to train you to do anything effectively. And uh, all militaries, all uh, I think pretty much every military in the world, at least in Denmark, I got an IQ test in the military. And even if you seek a job, they often give you an IQ test. They won't tell you it's an IQ test, but they are testing your IQ. Kind of figuring out if, if uh, can, can you even solve these problems? Maybe you're not educated to solve them so you don't have the experience to solve them but if you have very low IQ then they know that you will not be able to solve these complicated problems often if you are CEO for example CEOs have very very high average IQ very high because they, they're doing complicated stuff and this was all if you think I spoke too fast or if I missed something or if I just mumbled too much or other such stuff then I will of course re-record the whole lecture also look more into the some of the stuff I talked uh, about because there were a lot of these areas I kind of forgot a little bit about because it had been some time since, uh, since I really studied it in depth and read all these academic papers about it and stuff like that but uh, I think this is a fine introduction for now and if you want something to expand it upon or if you want me to re-record it then just tell me and I will do that Thank you.